Well, good evening, church family. Let's stand together. Let's join together and sing. Come, Christians, join to sing. Number 90. If you need your hymn book, it's right there in front of you. If this isn't a familiar song, let's sing. Number 90. Come, Christians, join to sing. Come, Christians, join to sing. and praise the Lord, isn't it? Sing songs that have meaning to them and give Him glory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come into the house of God, to the church building, the assembled church, and we come with burdens. We come with tests and trials and many things that may be heavy on the hearts of the people tonight. And to those that have that, we pray that you would comfort them strengthen them, and help them for having been in church to fellowship with other Christians. And then, Lord, we just pray that we would hear the message that you want us to hear tonight. And then, Lord, help us to not just hear it, but to put it in spiritual shoe leather, to do something with it, and to take notes, and to remember what is said, and take it out with us, and then put it into our lives to live it for your honor and glory. We pray if there's a person here that doesn't know Christ as Savior. And I would imagine there might be someone like that here, God. You know. Please deal with them. Break their hearts. Humble them. Draw them by your spirit to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. May you just work in our midst. Help us to do what you lead us to do. Be honest with you and honest with the Holy Spirit as you convict our lives. Thank you for the preaching of your word, the teaching of it that edifies us, builds us up, and prepares the people to go out and serve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, welcome back to church. We're glad you're here tonight. Thank you for coming. If you're a guest, we're glad you're here. Do me a favor, if you would, visitor, and pull out a green card that's right in front of you. It says, let's connect. Fill that card out on your way out tonight. Put it in the black boxes in the foyer. We'll pray for you this week and send you a gift in the mail just to say thanks for being here. I do want to remind you that tomorrow morning uh, is the funeral service for Miss Margie Price, longtime faithful member here at Worth Baptist Church, just a sweet, sweet lady. Her service is at 11 o'clock at Laurel Land Cemetery. It's a graveside service. So get there a little bit early. You can stop by the main office and they'll be happy to direct you. Please pray for her family. And I hope as many of you as can attend will attend. All right, at this time, the choir is going to sing.
can take it all to him and it's covered. Let's stand together and sing number 69 and sing of our love for him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Number 69. There is a name I love to be. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Well, look around the auditorium. Find someone you don't know shake their hand and welcome them. Let's come back together. Let's sing. It tells of one whose loving heart. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. I think about Jesus, I think about all the messages I've heard over and over, when you think about him, when God looks at me, he doesn't see my sin and my unworthiness, he says he sees Christ, and that's complete. My worth is not in what I own or in myself or anything I've accomplished, but it's in Christ alone. Let's sing, my worth is not in what I own. If you don't know it, hum along until you get it, all right, and we'll sing, the words will be up on the screen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in 
pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flow at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him no other, my soul is satisfied in Him alone. Verse 3 and verse 4. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might, or humans completing light. But I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him no other, my soul is satisfied in Him. wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. Great singing, you may be seated. Be the one 
Thank you for that song. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, go with me tonight to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. How many of our boys and girls, maybe elementary, junior high, high school, even college kids are fired up about spring break? Yeah, a lot of hands raised there. Very good. Anybody traveling or going out of town on spring break? A few of you are. That's great. I'm going to Pensacola. I'm not going to the beach. I'm going to preach. Won't even have time to go to the beach. It's a sad thing to be in Pensacola on spring break and be cooped up inside all week, but I will be. You pray for me if you wouldn't pray for all those people I'll be preaching to who wish they were at the beach, okay? Uh, we really had a good morning this morning, I thought, with baby day, spring forward, Sunday, spring break. It was great to see the house packed and great to see what God did and looking forward to a good time in God's word tonight. One of my favorite little stories is about the preacher who came to the pulpit one Sunday and he had a Band-Aid on his face. He said, I want to apologize for my appearance today. I was shaving this morning and while I was shaving, I was thinking about the sermon and I cut my face. So I apologize for the Band-Aid. Well, after the service, he got a comment card. I'm sure it was anonymous. The person didn't sign their names. All the best ones are anonymous. And the comment card said, next time, think about your face and cut the sermon. <laughs> Many Christians would like to cut the sermon. Christians are cutting attendance at weekly worship. They go to a small group or Bible study instead of going to church. Churches are canceling services. There's only one preaching opportunity per week. and It's preempted by an hour-long concert and laser light show. The preacher finally gets to the pulpit after people's emotions have been manipulated and their cerebral cortex has been bombarded with stimulation. And after such an elaborate production, he feels as if he has to keep the people's attention by telling jokes or sad stories or peppering his sermon with pop culture references. There's very little explanation of scripture in America's pulpits anymore. There's very little reading of scripture in America's pulpits anymore. Here's a devotional thought we tack on to the end of the show. We'll see you next week. Make sure to give your offering. I don't know, maybe they have a point. Is preaching still the best way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish in church? We're no longer in an age of oratory. We're in the age of the video. All week long, we watch movies with explosions and car chases and uh, shootouts, romantic encounters between beautiful people. Then we come to church on a Sunday and a guy stands up and reads from a book, explains uh, what he reads, and then applies that to our lives for about 30 minutes. Can we really expect that to hold the attention of modern people? Gen Z spends more time on TikTok than any other app. If you're not familiar, TikToks are short videos, sometimes just three or four seconds long. They give you a quick laugh or make you think about something and then uh, right off the bat, another video plays. I read one study that said the average user spends 90 minutes a day on TikTok and watches between one and 2,000 videos per day, if you can imagine that. Can people who are used to focusing on a particular thought for three to seven seconds max focus long enough to get anything out of a 30-minute sermon anymore? I think it's true that our minds work differently than they did a century ago. We process more information in a day than our ancestors processed In a week, our culture is changing. Think with me. Other than comedians and TED Talks, who else is trying to do what we do each week when we stand up and talk for so long? Maybe it would be more effective to have shorter, punchier sermons. Maybe maybe people would pay better attention if I dressed up like Super Mario or Darth Vader every week like they do at some churches. (laughs) Given the drop-off in attendance between Sunday morning and Sunday evening worship, isn't the average American Christian voting for less 
preaching. I think they are. I want to tell you tonight, the Bible teaches that God highly esteems the preaching of his word. Preaching is the primary way that the gospel is communicated. The lost are converted and believers are edified. Preaching is not optional or incidental. It is essential and fundamental if we are to become the people that God wants us to be. And the modern person needs the message of 1 Thessalonians 5.20 as much as the Thessalonians did when Paul wrote it. Look with me. We'll take up our reading first of all in verse 19. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And I take my title from verse 20, three simple words, despise not prophesying. You'll, be no, you'll not be surprised by this. I have three points tonight. Isn't that novel? A Baptist pastor has three points. The first one will take the vast majority of our time. So do not be alarmed if we're 25 minutes in and I still haven't gotten to point two. When I get to point two, young people on spring break, that's the five minute warning. All right. I want you to notice in the first place tonight, the command, despise, not prophesying. Remember, we're in a section that addresses God-pleasing worship. A few weeks ago, we said that God-pleasing worship is joyful, prayerful, and grateful. Now, Paul tells us it is scriptural, that the word of God is just as an, is just as an, is just as essential in a worship service as prayer and singing and expressions of thanksgiving, and we're not to despise the preaching of God's word. Now, despise is kind of a strong word. Uh, there are very few things in life we probably do despise. I think, when I think about the word despise, I think about the way that Philadelphia Eagles fans feel about the Dallas Cowboys. I think about the way that Dallas Cowboy fans feel about the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm gonna be honest, I despise the Eagles, I really do. So, of course, if I were to ask you if you despise the preaching of God's word, you would say, of course I don't. I'm here on a Sunday night on spring break, aren't I? I don't despise the preaching of God's word. Well, the word means here to have no use for something. That's what the word despise means, to have no use for something. There are tools in my house that I have no use for because I'm not very handy. I have not discarded them. I just don't use them. To despise preaching doesn't mean that you discard preaching altogether. It just means you don't find it as useful as you should. It means to have no use for something, to regard something as beneath one's consideration. Maybe you've come to the place in your Christian life where you say things like this. There was a time early on when I needed preaching. I didn't understand the Bible in the infant days of my Christian life, but now that I've been a Christian for a while and I've advanced to a certain stage of maturity, I no longer need it. Preaching is beneath me. I just remind you tonight, we never outgrow the declaration of God's word. Never. Sometimes it's not the act of preaching that we view as beneath us, but a particular preacher that we view as beneath us. Some might say, I'm a barber man. The preaching of Gillette is beneath me. <laughs> Paul told the church at Corinth that they were carnal for making those kind of distinctions. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. That's carnality. Men plant and water the seed, but God uses it to bring forth fruit. I hear people say, I listen to so-and-so on the radio, and he's an excellent preacher. And the average Sunday night message at a Baptist church just doesn't compare. Now, I like a lot of those radio preachers, and I've benefited from their ministry immensely. I listen to them. Did you know the average radio preacher preaches 40 sermons a year? Most pastors will preach that many times in one or two months. I'll preach 10 times this week. Those radio pastors have research assistants who spend all week, hours each week, writing content for their preacher's sermons and searching for illustrations. So the 40 meals they serve each year are like five-star meals. And I like five-star meals that much, as much as the next guy. I don't know about you, the vast majority of my nourishment in life has come from meals that were filling, but forgettable. 
And when I get home tonight, I won't turn down my grilled cheese sandwich and tomato soup because Guy Fieri or Emerald Lagasse didn't cook it, okay? <laughs> it is the faithful teaching and preaching of God's word over the course of a lifetime that brings people to maturity. It's not the messenger, it's the message. Now, what does Paul mean when he says, despise not prophesying? That's an interesting word. On the infant days of the church, there were men and women with the spiritual gift of prophecy. We're talking about the early days before the canon of the New Testament was completed. And they would stand up in services and they would speak for God. They would have a new message other than the message that had been inspired in the Old Testament. And when they spoke, they spoke the very word of God. But when the New Testament was completed, the gift of prophecy was rendered inoperative. God's written word contains all that the believer needs. We don't need a new word from God today. In Revelation, we're warned about adding to God's word or taking away from it. The canon is complete. There is a sense in which preachers are still in a prophetic role. Prophets were not only foretellers who said things that God had never said before, who foretold the future, they were also forth tellers. Study the scriptures and you'll find out that much of the prophet's ministry was simply declaring what God had already said in his word. They tell people what God says, they tell people what it means, and they tell them what to do with what it says it means. We should never look down on that. Preachers today have that aspect of a prophetic ministry. They declare the prophetic words that God has already spoken. We should never treat that as beneath us or as if we've grown beyond it. We should never lightly esteem what God highly esteems. And God highly esteems the declaration of his word. I want to give you just a few reasons tonight why we should highly esteem preaching. Number one. God saves the lost through the foolishness of preaching. First Corinthians says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching is simply the heralding and declaring of God's word. Paul said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I say it clearly. There is no genuine salvation apart from the declaration of God's word. Wherever salvation has happened, someone has declared the word. Maybe it was a soul winner. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a personal testimony or someone wrote a gospel tract. But salvation comes to the declaration of God's word. Now, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, the world has always regarded the declaration of a crucified savior as foolishness. This is not some modern thing where people no longer want to hear preaching anymore. Paul said going all the way back to the first century when they didn't have TikTok and they didn't have video and they didn't have movies, people still didn't want to hear the preaching of the cross. The world has always regarded the declaration of the cross as foolishness. But the Bible says it pleases God to use this means to save all who will believe. Preaching carries with it the promise of divine power. Dramas do not carry that promise. Concerts do not carry that promise. Discussion groups do not carry that promise. There is a particular power that accompanies the spirit-filled declaration of God's word. And through that power, lost people are converted. We should highly esteem it because God saves the lost through the foolishness of preaching. We should highly esteem preaching because it unleashes the word to do its work in our lives. Uh, go with me just a few pages forward to 2 Timothy chapter 3, a familiar passage of scripture. Look what Paul writes to his son in the faith. Look at verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man, also the woman of God, might be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This passage of scripture tells us what the inspired word of God does for a person who is uh, affected by it. First of all, it makes us wise unto salvation. We just talked about that. 
It is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, it tells us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. Why? So that we might be equipped to do everything that God has called us to do in the Christian life. The word is not only inspired, it is sufficient to do what needs to be done in the life of the believer. So what then is the application of 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17? Well, usually we make the application, I need to read the Bible. I need to have personal devotions. And that's a fine application, but it's actually not the application Paul was making in this passage. If you want to know what his application was, look at chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So think about all that the word of God can do. It makes us wise into salvation. It tells us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay right. So that we might be equipped to do everything that God wants us to do. Well, what then should we do with the word? We should preach it. And if someone should preach it, that means there are many that should hear it. Think about all the word of God should do, can do. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, isn't it? It's bread for our souls. It's honey to our lips. It's a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. Ezekiel declared the word of the Lord and a valley of dry bones was resurrected. Think about what God's word could do. We could go on and on and on. How many of you would say the word of God is instrumental to my spiritual growth? I can't grow without it. Hope every Baptist would say a hearty amen. Here's the point Paul's making. Everything the word does, preaching does. Everything the word does, the preaching of the word does. And it is just as instrumental to your spiritual growth as your personal devotions and your Bible studies and your small groups and anything else you do with the word. We need preaching. Preaching allows pastors and teachers to use their spiritual gifts. Ephesians 4 says that God gives pastor, teachers, and evangelists to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Preaching is a spiritual gift that God gives to people at his discretion. Not everyone is gifted to preach. If you don't believe that, try it out sometime. I will say it's harder than it looks. You say, you don't make it look incredibly easy. Well, it's even harder than I make it look, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, the next time someone apologizes to me for going to sleep in my sermon, I'm going to make them preach next Sunday. <laughs> and by the way, you don't have to tell me you fell asleep. Believe it or not, I can see you right now. I know, okay? You don't ever have to tell me. So next time someone falls asleep, I'm going to ask them to preach next Sunday. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay up till two o'clock the Saturday night before watching TV. And I'm going to dare you to keep me awake. There is a gifting involved. No preacher calls himself. God calls him. God enables him and empowers him to preach. And if God gives a man the aptness and eagerness to preach his word, that means he must also give his ears an aptness and eagerness to hear the word. Pastors you need to exercise their spiritual gifts by preaching, and people need the exercise of the pastor's gifts as they listen to the preaching. Let me give you another reason. Preaching helps us read our Bibles better. Now, that's real practical, but it's true. How many of you have ever heard something in a sermon, and you said, you know, I've read that passage a hundred times, but I've never seen that. And there it is. It's right there. How did I ever miss it? Good preaching helps you see it for yourself. See, here's what happens. A man week in and week out reads a text. He explains a text. He applies a text. He brings the application from his teaching and makes it crystal clear. You know what happens? Those sermons become a schoolroom in which the hearer learns how to study God's word. As they're having their devotional time, they start reading text and explaining text and applying text. It's like a classroom. As a preacher actually preaches God's word, you learn how to study God's word and to make sense of it in your daily life. And you start to see some things that maybe the preacher didn't see. And that's how it's supposed to work. And number five, preaching pleases God. That's what it said in 1 Corinthians 1. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. God didn't choose to communicate his message through a video. He could have if he wanted to. 
He didn't choose to communicate his message through TikTok. He chose to communicate his message through a written word. And he is pleased when people just have simple confidence in his power and stand up and let his word do the work. Now, folks, we cannot improve upon divine wisdom. We're never going to come up with a better way of building God's kingdom or equipping God's people than God's idea. We're never going to outsmart God. So we should never look down on that which God is pleased to use. And God is pleased to use preaching. So don't despise it. We have some young and aspiring preachers in the room tonight. If we want people to have a high opinion of preaching, we need to have a high opinion of it. People should never look down on preaching. We shouldn't help them look down on preaching. Here are some ways that preachers despise preaching. When they routinely cancel preaching services. Now listen, I know I'm not talking to a room full of pastors, but let me say this. If a pastor cancels preaching every time there's a big game on or a few drops of water or dropping from the sky, people are going to get the idea that preaching isn't all that important to that pastor. Preachers despise preaching when they preach half-baked, unprepared messages. What did Paul tell Timothy? Study to show thyself approved unto God. I'm going to tell you, mature Christians can tell when their pastors prayed for the sermon. They can tell when the pastor is prepared. Some pastors enjoy studying more than others. Some prefer the social aspects of pastoring more than others. But let me say this, pastors who ignore the study and preaching of God's word, who treat it lightly, are being unfaithful to their calling. What did the apostle say? We will give ourselves to preaching and prayer. Those are the priorities. Preachers despise preaching when they preach without passion. This is not a lecture. It's not even a Sunday school class. Martin Lloyd-Jones said preaching is truth set on fire. It's declaring the king's message to the king's people. And if our messages don't move us, they will not move our hearers. I like what early American pastor John Shaw said. He said, you must bring fire to kindle fire. And if you want to kindle fire in the pulpit, you have to bring it with you. Preach with passion. Preachers despise preaching when they fail to make application. Some sermons are a little more than a running commentary. Like Dr. Weaver prayed tonight, there comes a time when you need to bind the Bible up in shoe leather and show people what it means to live for Christ on a Monday morning at work or on a Tuesday morning at the house. Every time you preach, preacher, people ought to be able to leave uh, and answer two questions. Number one, what did the preacher say? And if they can't answer that in a sentence or two, you've missed the point. Number two, what am I supposed to do with it? And if we don't give them the information that they need from the text, we haven't preached. If we don't tell them how to apply it to their lives, we haven't preached. The sermon doesn't begin until the application begins. Now, a lot of people are fine with reading a text and explaining a text. It's when you actually go to the trouble of applying the text that they're not as crazy about the act of preaching. Do it anyway. Preachers despise preaching when they don't live what they preach. Now, every preacher preaches about a perfect savior from a perfect book. But every preacher is an imperfect messenger of a perfect savior preaching from a perfect book. The best of men are men at best. So there will always be a little bit of difference between what we preach and how we live. We can't help that. We're fallen sinners. Let me say this, the quickest way to undermine confidence in preaching is to be an angel in the pulpit and a devil outside of it. And every preacher, whether you're an evangelist, whether you're a guest preacher, whether you're a pastor, every preacher ought to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. So preachers can preach in such a way that it causes their hearers to despise preaching. Don't be that kind of preacher. You highly regard it, and the people who hear you will highly regard it. Now, let's talk to the vast majority of people in the room. How do people despise preaching? How do hearers despise preaching? Well, here's one way, by not showing up. <laughs> I don't need this. 
I need football. I need shopping. I need television more than I need the preaching of God's word. That is the textbook definition of despising prophesying. Another way that hearers despise preaching is by showing up unprepared. Like I said before, staying up all hours of the night on Saturday. Not giving a moment's thought about the worship service until it actually begins. We don't pray for the preacher. We don't bring our Bibles. We don't bring anything to take notes. Let me ask you guys and gals, if the CEO of your company was giving an address tomorrow, I think you'd get there early, you'd have a pen, and you'd have something to write down some notes, right? Because it's instrumental to your success that you hear from your CEO. It is instrumental to our spiritual growth that we hear from God and his word and his men. It's instrumental. Another way that hearers despise preaching is by valuing style over substance. Oh, don't miss this. There are some of you who are so cultured, you can't get anything out of a country preacher who dangles his proposition, prepositions. Uh, you wouldn't like John the Baptist very much. There are some of you who can't get anything out of it if it's not a country preacher. And you wouldn't like Paul and you wouldn't like Dr. Luke. Some would say, I like old fashioned fire and brimstone preaching. Others, I like eloquent, poetic preaching. Others, I like intelligent, articulate preaching. Others would say, give me heart preaching. I like a preacher who can make me cry. Well, how about this? I like Bible preaching. <laughs> if a preacher doesn't preach the word, it doesn't matter how eloquent or demonstrative he was. It wasn't preaching. We ought to have such an appetite for the Bible that any time someone opens a text, explains a text, and applies a text, no matter how he did it, we're satisfied and we're helped. It ought to be the Bible we're after, not style. Here's another way we can despise prophesying. By never responding to the message or changing because of it. What's the difference in teaching and preaching? There are several, and they teach classes about this in seminary. But here's the fundamental difference. Preaching demands a verdict. It demands a decision. It brings you to a crossroads. And when a service, there are always visible signs of God's work in people. Not everyone comes forward. Not everyone fills out a decision card. I know that. But when the word of God falls on good ground, and by the way, the condition of the ground is my responsibility as the hearer of the word. When the word of God falls on good ground, it will bring forth fruit. There will be a response. There will be a change. When you hear a faithful Bible message on soul winning and you're not soul winning, how should you respond? It's not rocket science. I'm going to pick up some gospel tracks on the way out. And this week, I'm going to soul win. When you hear a message on giving and you hadn't tithed in three months, what should be the response? I'm going to give. When you hear a message on prayer and you only pray at mealtime, what should be the response? I'm going to pray. And if that isn't happening, we're not hearing good faith. Do you understand that? If we hear a message that speaks to a need in our life, the shoe fits and we have to put it on, but there's no real change, then we're not here in good faith. We're here to be seen. We're here to be entertained. That is an exercise in futility. Remember what James says? It's like looking in a mirror, seeing a big glob of dirt on your face, doing nothing about it, and then forgetting that you ever saw it. And that's a lot like the average sermon. God speaks to our heart for a second. He brings something to the surface. We're not going forward. He wants us to go forward, but we're not going forward. We haven't gone forward since 1963, and we're not starting now, okay? Then someone talks to us about the cowboys on the way out. We argue with the wife on the way home, and it's in one ear, out the other, and we forgot there was a dirty spot there anyway, right? Now, you were here. You said amen. You even took notes. But did you highly esteem the preaching of God's word? I say not. Be not hearers of the word only. Be doers of the word. So modern people in love with YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and video despise not preaching. 
That's the command. Secondly, five minute warning. (laughs) Notice the consequence of disregarding the command. Look at verse 19. Quench not the spirit. These two commands are connected. Now, what's the command here? Don't put out the spirit's fire. It's connected to the next command, despise not prophesy. You know what happens when the preacher's preaching if the Holy Spirit's in it? It lights a fire in your heart. That's what the men on the road of Emmaus said as Jesus explained the scripture. He said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? What Paul is telling us here, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart through the preaching of God's word. Let him light your heart aflame. Don't put out that fire. Don't dampen that fire. Don't discourage that fire. Don't quench it. And when we look down on God's word and we fail to respond to the preaching, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. What a tremendous fire God wants to light in your life. You hear people talk about Christians who are on fire for God. Don't you want to be that Christian? The Holy Spirit wants you to be that Christian. He wants to light a flame in all of your lives through the teaching and preaching of God's word. When we lightly esteem God's word and the declaration of it, we quench the Holy Spirit. And I believe one of the reasons for the terrible state of the American church is that there are so few opportunities to hear God's word. God's people are despising God's word and they have quenched the Holy Spirit. Lastly, look at the benefits of obeying the command. What will happen if you highly esteem the preaching of God's word? Look at verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. He gives you three benefits for highly esteeming preaching. Number one, you'll be a discerning Christian. He says, prove that, or prove all things. The word prove means to test. It has the idea of putting metal into a fire to see what is genuine and what is dross. Test it. What he's telling us here, and this is all in the context of the preaching prophesying act. Take everything that you hear and test it against God's word. Be a Berean Christian. Don't just believe something because your favorite preacher says it the way you like it said. Take everything that's said from the pulpit and examine it, test it by the standard of God's word. And when you do that, week in and week out, you hear Bible preaching and you're constantly testing it. You're proving all things. You become a discerning person who's able to discern between good and evil. He says, you'll be a discerning Christian. Then he says, when you highly esteem preaching, you will hold fast to that which is good. Now stay with me. This is important. The word hold fast has the idea of holding down. We're to take the truth that we heard on Sunday and we're to hold it down so we don't lose what we heard. If it's good, if it lines up with God's word, if it passes the test of the scriptures, when you hear it and God speaks to your heart, hold it down and don't let it go. I don't know how many of you have dogs in the house. We have a golden retriever. She's redheaded and hyperactive, just like everything else in my life. I think she gets it from her dad. I don't know. On rare occasions, we give the golden retriever a bath. I don't know about your dog. Our our dog hates baths. As soon as you turn on the water and try to place her in the tub or get the water hose fired up, she tries to run. She doesn't like it. So what do you have? When she gets out of the bath, we're trying to put a towel on her and she tries to get away and wet dogs are slick, aren't they? So we say, hold on to her, hold her down. Don't let her go because if she goes, she's going to run all over the house and she's going to shake and get water everywhere. Hold on to her. Don't let her go. And that's a lot like the truth that we hear on church on Sundays. 
for a moment, it's alive and it speaks and the Holy Spirit convicts. And he says, go down to the altar and make a decision. Get right in this area of your life. Apply it in this particular way. And for a moment, the flame burns. But if we're not careful, it dies very quickly. So he says, as you leave, hold it down. Do everything you can to keep that truth before you. Meditate it on, on it throughout the week. Apply it to your life. If God speaks to your heart, don't you dare let it go. Hold it down. Don't let it go. And we don't grow because of preaching because many times we fail to hold fast that which is good. And then he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Refuse what is evil. No matter how funny or eloquent the message was, if it doesn't pass the scriptural test, chunk it. Refuse it and go somewhere where you can get something that's good. So here's the point tonight. God highly esteems the preaching of his word. It pleases him when his word is preached. Don't ever look down on what God makes much of. Come to church hungry. Come ready to hear from God. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit as the man of God reveals the Son of God and the Word of God. There is nothing more transformative in our lives than that. God highly regards it, and we should too. So what's the message? It took me about 30 minutes to say what Paul said in three words. Despise not preaching. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It does so much in our lives if we'll allow it to do its work. We believe it is inspired. We believe it's authoritative and we believe it's sufficient. And when it's declared, it will do the work you intend for it to do. Lord, help us in our attitudes and actions to highly esteem you and to highly esteem your word and to highly esteem preaching. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll have a verse of invitation. If you're here today without Christ, the most important decision you could ever make is to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. We'd invite you to leave your seat and let someone show you from a Bible how you can be saved. Believer, the altar is open. You come tonight. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words.
wonderful words of And all God's people said, Amen. let me give you just a few announcements if I can. Don't forget Easter Sunday is coming up very soon. We're getting close. It's the last Sunday of March. So start inviting people to be your guest. We have a few ways for you to do that. We have a window cling that you can put on your car. Now, please only do this if you're going to drive like a Christian. All right. <laughs> how, <laughs> I probably shouldn't get into this. Um, <laughs> How many of you ever come north on I-35 past Alta Mesa? Yeah, you've seen that big protest out there, right? Well, uh, the other night I was riding with Tori and she has a moonroof in her car and those guys are slowing down traffic and I'm not for what they're doing at all. So I just reached out the moonroof and gave them a big thumbs down as I drove down the road. I think she had this sticker on her car. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Should have done that in my car because I don't have the sticker on yet. <laughs> Put one of these on your car, drive for a Christian. People will look up the website and find out some information about Easter, all right? Don't forget, we have peeps for our peeps on your way out tonight. Grab a few boxes of these. Um, children, precious, precious children. These are not for you to eat, okay? <laughs> They're for your friends to eat. Your parents have a lot of money. If you want peeps, ask your parents. They'll buy you peeps. They'll buy you better candy than peeps. They make Reese's peanut butter eggs, and those are a whole lot better than peeps. Yeah. So hand the peeps to your friends and eat the eggs yourself, all right? All right. Grab some of these, hand them out to your neighbors and your friends, okay? Now, real quick, if you're a deacon, we have a very brief meeting tonight in the uh, empty nesters classroom, so we'll see you in there. If you're a Sunday school worker or a teacher in children's or adult, Brother Earl has a meeting with you over in the fellowship hall. Brother Earl, as of just a few weeks ago, became our new Sunday school superintendent, so he's going to be running the adult Sunday school and meeting with our workers much more regularly, and I'm very excited about that. Then don't forget, next Sunday is the deadline if you want to go on a mission trip. We have several openings on many of the trips. Stop by the bookstore, get all the information that you need, and bring it back and get it turned in by next Sunday, all right? It's been a good day in God's house. Thank you for being here. Boys and girls, enjoy your spring break. Have a blast, all right? God bless you as you go. Thanks for watching the Worth Baptist Church live stream. If you made a decision today, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to contact us on our website or simply give us a call. Worth Baptist Church exists to glorify God by making disciples in Fort Worth, the Metroplex, and around the world. We're committed to reaching the lost in our community, growing new believers into lifelong followers of Christ, and sending disciple makers both locally and globally. We hope you'll join us the next time we gather as we continue reaching, growing, and sending.